Ready? Uh, as I kind of think about what we did yesterday, I decided there weren't any uh, materials types of uh, uh, lessons yesterday, but the uh, two of the lessons is when industries are faced with the threat of extinction, um, they're often willing to take high risks necessary to survive. The mining industry and the steel industry have had the, some of the highest productivity growth rates um, in the wor in, of any industry over the last 20 years. I think the mining industry is like six or seven percent a year, and the steel industry has been about four percent a year. That obviously can't keep up forever, but uh, it did allow some people to survive because they're willing to take risks they wouldn't ordinarily take. Now there are some other industries when we're not talking structural uh, materials, but we're talking about uh, uh, functional materials where you don't have to um, push productivity; you can push for new products rather than improve pro processes in your in your factory. Um, the semiconductor industry is one example where, faced with the threat of extinction, extinction in the memory market, they decided to let it go. They let it go to other countries, and they moved higher up in the value chain by making more sophisticated chips. Um, but when you're talking about structural materials, that's not quite as easy to do when you're talking about a commodity type of material like steel or an ore in mining. Um, to give you an example of what happened in the steel industry, in 1975, the cost of building an integrated steel mill, which might produce six million tons of steel, is a pretty large volume operation, is $4 billion, roughly. Um, in 1985, the mini mills came, uh, became, actually the mini mills started about 10 years before, but uh, they became popular in the mid 80s. And it might cost $250 million, but you only produce one sixth as, um, uh, as much. However, if you uh, do the capital cost per ton on this, you find they've got a lower capital cost per ton uh, for the mini mill compared to the integrated. And in 1995, people were moving to. Um, Mini Mill Plus, which was actually increasing the size of this for, again, a lower capital cost per ton, or going to a smaller one, uh, Micro Mill, where you produce less, but again, a lower cost per ton. Um, so they, they keep on improving their the cost by redoing, reducing their capital costs. Um, to give you an idea about integrated steel, steel uh, today, uh, it would probably cost about $15 billion to build a new integrated steel plant. And as a result, it turns out no company has built a, an integrated steel plant anywhere in the world since 1965 when Bethlehem Steel, the second largest steel company in the world, built the Burns Harbor, Indiana plant for about $3 billion in the mid-60s, from 65 to, uh, to 69. Bethlehem Steel almost went bankrupt because $3 billion was a big investment back in 1965. Do mini mills, can they take the iron ore and make No, I'll talk about that in just a second. Hold up, just a second. Anyway, the, the, let me kind of finish this. The only, there have been many integrated steel plants built since 1969, but they've all been built by countries, because only countries can afford the risk. Bethlehem Steel, second largest and one of the most profitable companies in the world at the time, almost went bankrupt by building the next generation facility. Well, it turns out you have the same problem in semiconductor fab. The new semiconductor fab plant is about $10 billion. Even in Intel has a hard time and chokes on that type of capital investment. Uh, a new airplane, Boeing is trying to decide whether to build the 7E7, probably a 10 or $15 billion venture. What happened? Airbus got started because countries got together to start Airbus. The only people who can afford these huge um, capital costs of 10 to $15 billion are no longer companies, but countries. And so that's a different thing. Now, uh, you asked about, uh, do you start with ore? Well, the big thing about the mini mill is the people who, some of the people in the integrated steel industry where they start with the ore, and actually we'll talk about this next week a little bit. They start with the ore, you go through a blast furnace, and the blast furnace is probably about three or four billion of the $15 billion investment today. 
Well, if you get rid of the blast furnace and you don't start with ore, that's how you reduce some of your capital car costs. So the integrated mill starts with a ore and a blast furnace, turns it into cast iron, turns the cast iron into steel. In the early 70s, some people realized in the steel industry that it cost $180 a ton at that time to produce cast iron in a blast furnace for more. But you could buy scrap steel for $100 a ton. Well, you know, your raw material cost, if you're going to use recycled material, 100% recycled material, was about one half the cost of mining it out of the ground and turning it into cast iron. Whether you start with cast iron or whether you start out with steel scrap to make steel, it turns out that uh, you had a two-fold price advantage on the on the uh, cost of the steel. That answer your question. Uh, your question. Yeah. But they can't start with ore, right? They can't start with ore. Well, they couldn't start with ore when they started, and they couldn't make high-quality steel because starting with scrap, and all kinds of other tramp elements and stuff that you don't like, and they can only make garbage rebar initially. And all the integrated producers says, oh well, they'll never be a threat. They're just a little piece of the market. You know, well, they'll take the 2% off the bottom and we don't really care. Well, they're now 60% of the market because they keep on improving what they can do. They still are having a hard time making really high quality sheet, automotive sheet. And as a result, only the integrated mills can produce uh, the high quality automotive sheet that has to be stamped and painted to give you a nice finish. They can make the little wagons for your, uh, you know, the little red wagons that your kids pull around, okay? The mini mills can now make that type of sheet. They can't make high quality sheet, but they may get there. Uh, and it has to do with the tramp elements and the steel. Um, but the real advantage here was the, the raw material cost. They realized they could go to certain, they could go to scrap, 100% scrap. And there, so then people said, oh, well, there's not enough scrap. That's absurd. We've been putting 50 million tons of scrap into the environment for the last 100 years. There's 5 billion tons of scrap steel out there. And as uh, the head of the largest mini mill uh, group, uh, Ken Iverson has passed away now, but uh, Nucor once said, you raise the price of scrap steel by 10% and you'll have all you want. Now it's just a question of supply and demand. If you raise the price a little bit, there's 5 billion tons out there and it will come to market if you raise the price. So the, it turns out we don't need to mine, to, to mine as much iron ore as we used to. And then people kept on getting smaller and smaller, different types of economies of scale over here. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, but, so you can never get rid of the integrated mills because they, they still can't start with the ore. So to it's, not, it's not clear. The mini mills are now going to what they call direct reduced iron because the scrap, the scrap, as as 60% of the world's steel is now made by, by not 60% through the whole world, but uh, in, uh, let's say, the developed world, Japan, European community, and uh, the United States, there's getting to be a demand on scrap prices, and the scrap is getting a little more scarce because now they they're not making 2% of the steel by by 100% uh, uh, scrap. By the way, integrated mills use 30% scrap, okay, to make their stuff. But going from 30% to 100% is a big change in the scrap market when you go from 2% of the, the total to 100% uh, of the total. So they're now looking at something called direct reduced iron, um, and they have been for 10 or 15 years as a less expensive scrap, if you will, that they can use in their process. Uh, basically, you go to some place that has cheap natural gas, like Jamaica, um, and also has iron ore, and you basically use the natural gas to to reduce the ore. You don't have the blast furnace problem. You don't have the coke oven problem. Uh, the coke ovens are where you get the carbon to reduce the, uh, the iron ore in the blast furnace. Coke ovens are uh, one of the primary reasons for the Environmental Protection Air Act of 1972. Uh, anyone who ever, uh, well, you're all too young, but if you ever went through a steel mill town, um, uh, Pre-1975, you could you could smell the town from 50 miles away, basically, because of the coke ovens and all the sulfur emissions and everything else, and all the carcinogens going in the air. Um, but basically, and some people predict there will be no more coke ovens in another 20 or 30 years, because um, not because they're worn out, but because the environmental regulations basically say get rid of them. So it was an old process, um, well, old process, 100 about 120 years old. Um, 
and it's going the way of all flesh. So will there be integrated mills in the future? Well, they're going to have to change, and you'll have some sort of modification between the two of them. The mini mills um, will start using some sort of ore. They have been in certain part, parts of the world where they have lots of natural gas and iron ore to make direct reduced iron. Is that kind of a convoluted answer to, to your question? Okay, so the steel mills um, have, uh, and actually, let me, I'll tell you another little side. Um, anybody ever read Innovator's Dilemma? Clayton Christensen's book? Okay, well, a few years ago when Clayton was working on his book, my, one of my oldest daughter was actually took a summer job with him and, and was doing some of the research. She came home, home one night and said, Dad, uh, can, you, can you help me? I'm supposed to find out what it costs to build, the capital cost to build an integrated steel plant. And she, she'd been looking and she couldn't find it anywhere. I said, well, I guess you don't, I guess you can't, but I happen to have an overhead <laughs> on it, which was this overhead that I, <clears throat> so now, so I brought it home and it turns out I'm referenced on a little footnote in Innovator's Dilemma. Um, now I'll tell you where the data came from. One of my students and I had visited General Motors in Saginaw and we were sitting in the airport and I was talking to him, we were talking, I had this, thesis at the time, my thesis didn't end up being his doctoral thesis, but that there, you could often go to smaller scale production and be more efficient because of distributed manufacturing. Anyway, um, he, the student ended up disagreeing with me and writing a thesis on a different topic, but, um, but anyway, I wrote this down as kind of an example. And the numbers I made up out of my head in the airport in Saginaw, Michigan. So that's the quality of the information. Now, it's not necessarily that bad an information, or a magnitude is right, because I know something about the steel industry. But that's kind of somehow where, where you know, these things, you know, that's, you have to ask what the source of the data is. For example, uh, about two or three years ago, I was reading the latest edition, uh, reading or opened up the, the latest edition of the American Welding Society Handbook, and it said that there were about a half a million, there were, that it had a reference from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, you know, which is a part of the U.S. government, that said that there were half a million welders in the United States and another one and a half or two million that welded part-time, uh, full -time, about a half million full-time welders. And I thought, boy, that sounds very similar to something I said about 1980 in a talk I gave on welding. And so I called up the American Welding Society f to find out how the Bureau of Labor Statistics got their... Uh, their data, and it turns out they called the American Welding Society, who, who quoted me. <laughs> so I know it's good data. <laughs> so we have some of the circular logic here. Um, it turns out that uh, the way I estimated that originally is I said, well, how many pounds of welding electrodes are sold each year, and how much can a welder lay down, how many pounds can an average welder put down in a day, and I came up with a number of like seven or 800,000 people necessary to deposit that amount of weld metal each year. Well, I said, well, they're not all full-time welders. Let's say two-thirds of them are full-time, the others are part-time, you know. So, <laughs> well, what's wrong with that estimate? I, it's just as good as anybody else's, right? <laughs> I had a basis for it, but it's sort of funny to see where statistics come from. I told you there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. Okay. Um, then I told you the story of looking for Easter eggs. Don't always try to work harder than the competition. Be a little humble. Recognize that there's some, if there's one thing MIT should teach you is to be humble, right? You'll find other people that work harder, and you'll find other people who work smarter, uh, or are smarter. Not necessarily work smarter, but are smarter than you. So you ought to look for the prize where other people aren't looking. And the, uh, the quote from that, Kent Bowen, who founded LFM for you L LFMers, is now at Harvard Business School. He was a faculty member in course three in ceramics. But anyway, he used to have this on his wall uh, from Rudyard Kipling. They copied all they could follow, but they couldn't copy my mind, and I left them sweating and stealing a year and a half behind. Um, so you do have to work smarter. I learned that in the first couple of months I was at MIT. As a young faculty member, I started looking at my cost to, to support a graduate student versus some state university, and I said, wow, their costs are one half mine. Well, this is no different than a business looking and seeing that their costs are, uh, are twice what some other uh, country's costs are. In fact, I have an LFM student working in another industry 
right here in the local area. Uh, it's actually a, um, a refractory metals industry, and the Chinese have entered the market, and their sales have decreased in this one little area of their plant by 50% in the last three years because the Chinese are coming in and cutting costs. And it turns out, I was reading his uh, presentation this morning, um, it turns out that their labor costs here in the U.S. are 40% of their production costs. Well, how are you going to compete with the Chinese if your product costs 40% labor? They have got to take the high risk to quit thinking about continuous improvement. Continuous improvement is fine if things are not changing very rapidly. But when the Chinese enter the market, continuous improvement is the, is the road to death. As I told them in an email this morning, um, the patients are able to die before they get to the operating room, okay? Uh, particularly if their heartbeat just dropped 50%. Okay. okay, so I've said enough about, well, actually I haven't said quite enough about steel. Um, I do have another overhead in here about steel. Well, actually, before I get to the overhead on steel, let me do something else. Let me, let's compare a couple of different materials in something called the ratio analysis diagram. The ratio analysis in diagram was invented by uh, Dr. Polini at the Naval Research Laboratory in the early 1950s. And what had happened is during World War II, the, the welded Liberty ships um, actually cracked. Some of them just split open in the middle of the North Atlantic and I think uh, over 100 ships out of three or 4,000 had major cracks and something like 50 or 50 of them just broke right in two and sank, uh, killing most of the people on board. This was, people were not happy about this, so after World War II, there were three major centers set up to try to understand why these ships fractured the way they did. One was located that they actually started the British Welding Institute outside of Cambridge, England. Another was the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, D.C., and the third was MIT. Right here. And those are the three places that um, looked into the whole problem of brittle fracture. Back before uh, 1950, people always thought the only thing you had to worry about in a material was the strength of the material, the force of fracture. That's the yield strength of the material. They learned in the 1950s that you also have to be worried about the energy of fracture, which is the toughness of the material. And you plot yield strength versus toughness. And for this case, this is the ratio, what's called the ratio analysis diagram for steels. You find that at low strengths, you can, things can be very pliable, very ductile, very tough. But as you get to higher and higher strength steels, these are really high strength steels. This is 200 KSI. Your typical structural steels are not even on this plot. This only goes down to 80. Typical structural steels might be 70, OK? But when you go to a very high strength steel, like aircraft landing gears, or some medical instruments like those little catheter wires I talked about, the toughness drops precipitously. This is considered the technological limit. As you get the higher strength steels, higher and higher strength, more and more brittle. Um, you can, we'll talk about this later, but there's fracture mechanics can tell you what the critical flaw size would be. And typical critical flaw sizes for lower strength steels could be this is critical section thickness, two and a half inches. Well, that's not that's a pretty good size crack. You ought to be able to find that. But you get to really high strengths, and you'll find that the critical flaw sizes can be a tenth of an inch or less in a material like a very high strength steel. That's the ratio analysis diagram we'll probably come for, for steel. If you look at that same type of diagram, and the only three I know of are for steel, aluminum, and titanium. I've never seen them for any other material because Frankly, that's uh, most of structural materials. No one's ever done it for copper because copper doesn't go to that high a strength, and copper has tremendous toughness. Um, and so if you did it for copper, you would find the strength drops off precipitously, but its toughness stays up. And so it's not a very interesting diagram. However, for aluminum alloys, this is your typical structural aluminums down here in this region, but if you go, or structural uh, alloys, that are weldable and making simple structures, you go to the very high strength things that you're going to use for aircraft, and you're going to find your toughness drops by a factor of three, because you went up a factor of two in strength. 
And your critical flaw sizes are, again, down in this tenth of an inch type of size range. Um, you also, if you compared the diagrams here with the steel, well, I'll, I'll show you the comparison in a second on another graph. Um, then titanium, titanium has greater toughness than, than uh, aluminum uh, and goes to higher strengths, but it has a similar type of ratio analysis diagram. And as you go to the highest strength alloys, your, your flaw, critical flaw sizes that will cause a brittle fracture drop to less than a tenth of an inch and you run into inspection problems. Um, a number of years ago, I plotted not just for steel, titanium, and aluminum, but for composites, plastics, and ceramics, the fracture toughness or the ratio analysis diagram. This is, I mean, the, the steel, titanium, and aluminum came from the three plots you just saw, and I put them all on the same scale. You want to be way out here. You want high strength and high toughness, so goodness is, is out in that direction. Low strength materials will deform readily, simple plastic yielding. Um, brittle materials have very small critical flaw sizes and are out here. Most of what we design is somewhere in what we call the elastic plastic mix mode. The good thing about that is it's hard to analyze uh, uh, in the computer. Uh, makes things difficult. Actually, this one's hard to analyze. This one's the easiest one to analyze. Uh, and we'll get to fracture mechanics next week. But nonetheless, you can see uh, not only is steel cheap, but when you talk about structural material, it's just way out ahead of anything else. Titanium is next, and it has excellent corrosion resistance, but as we're going to see in a second, it costs a lot more. Aluminum costs five or six times more, and in terms of designing out this way, it's actually not bad, um, but it doesn't go out as far as steel in terms of, but it is lighter. Um, but the ratio analysis diagrams look similar. Composite materials, for which most people would not think you should ever do a ratio analysis diagram, but I put the typical types of values on here. Composite materials never get to be plastic because inherently they've got a hard material and a soft material. They're composite of, of that uh, in, in almost every case. Um, you might be in the good area for design, but most of the time you're in the brittle region for design. And plastics, well, plastics, they're just plain weak. Now, you can get plastics that are very strong, but only in one dimension, sometimes a little bit of strength in two dimensions, and that's things like Kevlar fiber. And they say, stronger than steel on a weight basis, right? Well, they have to put in that phrase, on a weight basis. They're not stronger than steel on a, per pound, or on a, uh, on a volume basis, but since they have very, very low density, they are stronger in a single fiber form. You can't buy them in bulk with that type of strength, and you can't buy them in sheets in that type of uh, strength. But you can buy them as fibers and make composites out of them. Um, and ceramics, well, here's structural ceramics, OK? There is no such thing as a structural ceramic. Or actually, I used to say my ceramics colleagues got really upset with me. Um, they say, the, the, how did I phrase it? There is no such thing as uh, a, ceram a structural ceramic except uh, Portland cement and toilet bowls. Um, and I throw in the kitchen sink, except you have to line it with cast iron to give it fracture resistance. Okay, you know, the, the enameled porcelain sinks are actually porcelain on cast iron. Cast iron is probably one of the most brittle metals you can think of. But in fact, it's so much better. About a factor, in terms of toughness, it's about a factor of 10 or 20 times better than the best ceramics. Okay? So that's why you can make kitchen sinks out of cast iron and drop a pot in there and not have the whole thing shatter. Okay, if you made it out of porcelain and you drop the pot in there, well, just think about it. If you drop the heavy pot onto a glass pot, you might break it, right? So just think about it. Ceramics, whoever conceived the structural ceramics did not get past the freshman year in understanding uh, properties of materials. However, we did spend several billion dollars doing research on it. Um, because you can sell junk to almost anybody. Um, but fortunately, people have learned and they've, they've backed off. Okay, so now, actually, um, having told you about how wonderful steel is, I'll give you another Roger, uh, Roger Kipling quote. Gold is for the mister, silver for the maid, copper for the craftsman cunning at his trade. Good, said the baron, sitting in his hall, but iron, cold iron, is master of them all. So, even Roger Kipling understood where 
steel and iron were in the periodic table in terms of structural properties. So here is the periodic table, and we will now, after having spent two days, plus a little more, dealing with, um, all right, it looks better that way, um, dealing with the periodic table, we've now talked about that element. We can cross that off. <clears throat> Continuing on in this course, we only have, a, what, 107 to go. Um, but we'll finish up quite a few fairly quickly. Actually, we haven't quite finished iron because there's stainless steels. Um, stainless steels. There are a host of stainless steels. In fact, it seems like there are more stainless steels than there are of other types of steels. It, basically, stainless steel has more than 12% chromium, approximately, because when you do that, you end up with a chromium concentration on the surface that's high enough. Actually, you get an enrichment of chromium on the surface, and it gives it very good corrosion resistance in water environments. That's, what, uh, that's why they call it stainless. Okay, it was invented about 1910, or discovered. And it will also give a very good oxidation resistance at high temperatures. So there's really two root uses, two primary uses of stainless steels. Corrosion protection in aqueous environments and uh, oxidation protection at high temperatures. And there are a whole host of alloys basically built around the original stainless steel, which was about 18% chrome and, and 8 nickel. Sometimes you'll see 18.8 or 18.10 on silver dinnerware. 304 stainless steel. This is, I can't remember, about 70% of all the stainless steel made is the generic variety 304. It's, we it's weldable. If you want to make it machinable, you throw some sulfur in there. There ought to be something here going to 303. Maybe they don't list. Three. Oh, here's 303. For machinability, you go up here, you add either sulfur or selenium. Um, higher strength, I mean, there's, there's lots of things you do to modify that basic composition. You take the nickel out and you, make, you change the crystal structure and you make it a ferritic stainless steel. 430 is very, very common. Um, the automobile mufflers, if they're not aluminized steel, they're typically a 409 stainless steel, which is about as low as you can go in the chromium and still have good oxidation resistance. Um, um, so you're either going that way or that way. But the super ferritic stainless steels have interesting corrosion resistance in condensing steam environments, cond condensing, you know, kind of hot and a little bit of heat and, and uh, cold. Um, but the prices go up in almost all these directions as you move away from, from the center. Actually, it goes down in this direction and that direction. But in most of these other directions, you're adding cost. And eventually, you get up here where it's no longer an iron chrome nickel alloy. It becomes a nickel chrome iron alloy. And that becomes all your inconels, very high temperature alloys up here. Um, so the genealogy of stainless steel is very complex, to say the least. However. Um, a number of years ago, I had the opportunity for about three or four years to work for a testing laboratory that had all kinds of failure analyses. I used to go in for an afternoon and do four or five failure analyses. These were not; these were just kind of some company had something break, or some contractor had something they found that they corroded, and they wanted to know why it what had happened. Well, it turns out I saw a very interesting phenomena that I really didn't analyze until a number of years later. But about, even though stainless steel represents about 2 million tons um, a year in the United States, given the fact we use 100 million tons of steel, that's only about 2%. Uh, but the thing is, stainless, the, the problems I saw, people coming in with a fractured or a corroded piece of stainless steel, represent about 30% of the failures that I did. And I was doing hundreds of failures a year. Okay, So I was getting a reasonable sampling from a wide cross-section. Uh, I didn't see that many aluminum and copper because there's not that much used. I saw some, and I saw some nickel. But most, thing, most of the failures were on steels, just because it's 95% of all metals. But 30% of the steel failures were stainless steel. So stainless steel has many more failures than you would expect, by, I'd say by about a factor of 15 or so, based on the volume of its use. Why? Because everybody thinks, well, stainless steel, you know, it won't rust, it won't corrode. It'll last in any environment, right? We'll go down here to the New England Aquarium and look at the stainless steel panels on the outside of the building. Okay, they're supposed to represent fish scales. 
They have this brushed stainless steel. And the, the specification says, well, you take the stainless steel and you, you uh, stainless steel is kind of an interesting beast in that that chrome oxide surface that you get gives it the corrosion resistance, but it's not too hard to disturb that layer. And if you disturb the layer in the right type of environment, it can grow itself back and be self-healing. But if you do it in the wrong environment, it doesn't self-heal. Sort of like getting a, a cut on your arm that doesn't heal. Or sometimes the cut on your arm heals and sometimes it doesn't. And so people don't always know what to use. Um, one, one I had recently is a company over here that makes hot dogs. KM Hot Dogs, I think it is. can't remember. I walked to the plant and saw them making hot dogs. Remember what Bismarck said? Anybody remember what Bismarck said? He said, anyone, anyone who likes law or sausages should not watch either one of them being made. Okay. Um, but uh, in any case, they were supposed to have 316 stainless steel. Okay, lower carbon to actually that's 316 L. Where's 316 regular? 316. Add molybdenum for pitting resistance. Chloride pitting resistance. They put salt in hot dogs, believe it or not. And that has chlorides, and so they need pitting resistance. So the, the hot dog cooker was supposed to be 316 stainless steel, and they had some stainless steel. It was just it was like a piece of rotten wood. It was just the stainless steel was just falling apart. It would crumble in your hands. And they kind of weren't happy about this because it wasn't holding the hot dogs up as it went through the conveyor. And so they asked me to come over and see what the problem was. Well, I took a piece of the crumbled stuff and we analyzed it. Turns out someone had used 304. They left the molybdenum out and it had no chloride corrosion resistance. Well, getting back to the uh, New England Aquarium, what they had done is to give it this, this kind of fish scale appearance, they brushed the surface. And they had a spec that said, you must passivate the stainless steel. Stainless steels have to be passivated to give them corrosion resistance. I could take a piece of 304 stainless steel such as this happens to be a pair of medical scissors, okay? Actually, this is not 304. This is actually, a, this is actually up here. It's probably a 430, or it might be a Martin Siddick. It might be down here. Actually, it's probably a 420 down here. Um, but in any case, I could take this stainless steel, and I could put it in saline solution with hydrogen peroxide, and I could have it rusty and pitted within 24 hours. In fact, I've done it. I, I worked for a division of Johnson Johnson makes these things, and one time they sent me, said, why, is this, why are these instruments all, all pitted? They're just like sears, you know. If, they, if anything happens to your tools, send it back, and we'll, return, we'll replace it for free, because this pair of scissors costs about $300. Okay, I'll explain why in a little bit. In any case, um, uh, so they sent it to me. I looked at it. I just said, we saw a very aggressive environment. So the director of regulatory affairs at uh, J&J calls up the hospital out in the Midwest and says, uh, what'd you clean this stuff with? So, oh, why don't we just clean it? And they, they, they had the right sterilizing procedure and stuff. And he says, well, it must have seen something. Where, where'd these things come from? Well, well all the, the nurse says, all the tools in Dr. So-and-so's bag are like that. He says, oh, what else does he have in his bag? He says, well, just his special sterilizing solution, his personal sterilizing solution. He says, what is it? Saline solution and hydrogen peroxide. So we took saline solution and hydrogen peroxide, stuck it in, 24 hours, you're pitted, OK? Uh, so people don't realize that that's sort of the same thing if you didn't make it out of the better grade of stainless steel. You just like the hot dog cooker, chlorides will attack it. Well, down here at the aquarium, you're right on Boston Harbor. They have chlorides in the ocean, believe it or not. So these people had brushed the surface of this, and they had not passivated it after mechanically roughening the surface. And you'll see all these rust spots all over the thing, where it's, and you'll see the rust spots if you, you go up close and look. So they now have a rusty building made out of stainless steel. Um, and they're trying to clean it to get rid of it. Um, so you can have passivated stainless steel. If I were to take or you can have what we call active stainless steel. If I were to take this stainless steel and I would dip it into hydrochloric acid and leave it out in the air, within a few weeks it would be rusty because I activated the surface. I took off that protective chrome oxide in the hydrochloric acid or the saline solution with hydrogen oxidizing hydro, um, with the oxygen. Um, the, 
Other thing, um, what else do I want to say about that? Oh, to passivate it, you put it in an oxidizing acid, specifically usually nitric acid, the solution of nitric acid, which is an oxidizing acid, and that regrows the chrome oxide on the surface. So if the stainless steel is not properly passivated, it will corrode. If it's activated because of strong chlorides in the environment, it will corrode. Um, maybe I'll save the rest of these forever. These are different ways to make scissors. We'll talk about that another time. Um, so enough on steels or stainless steels. Anybody have any questions? What again was the surface that you... Did I want? Yeah. Well... It's actually a very complex thing. The easiest thing, and you find some books that simple, oversimplify it and just say it's chromium oxide. It's a chromium oxide. It is a chromium oxide, but you actually have to get into the band theory and the elect electronic theory of metals and oxides in order to really understand the electrochemical behavior of that surface and how it provides the corrosion resistance in water environments. But the easiest thing to say is just it's a chromium oxide that forms on the surface, and the chromium, chromium oxide is resistant to uh, to the uh, uh, corrosion. Is that sufficient? I've, I've way oversimplified it. Corrosion engineers would get all upset um, with how I oversimplified it. Okay, so let's talk about another metal on the periodic table, like aluminum. Aluminum, right? Aluminum did not exist. Um, except in very, very small quantities, rarer than gold before 1884. In fact, the top of the Washington Monument has got a little four-inch tip of aluminum. Because when they built the Washington Monument, aluminum was more valuable than gold. The um, royal dinnerware of France was made out of aluminum because it was more valuable than gold. What happened is Charles Martin Hall uh, and Paul Hero, Charles Martin Hall in Ohio and uh, Charles and Paul Haro in France independently found that if you took aluminum oxide and dissolved it in molten sodium aluminum fluoride um, uh, and then electrolyzed it at a thousand degrees centigrade, you could make molten aluminum from the ore. And that's called the Hall Haro process after Charles Martin Hall and Paul Haro. Um, Paul Haro went on to found a company called Pechenet, which is now one of the world's largest aluminum companies. And Charles Martin Hall went on to found a company called Alcoa, Aluminum Company of America, which at one time was beat up, was broken up by the Trust Busters into Alcoa and Alcan, Aluminum Company of Canada. Okay, so that's the genealogy of that. Well, what happened is from 1884 until the next 20 years, uh, aluminum was still kind of a curiosity, but then it started to take off. And it turns out the Wright brothers, uh, the engine for the Wright brothers uh, uh, aircraft 100 years ago was actually made out of an aluminum alloy uh, because you want lightweight. Uh, now, uh, so instead of being more valuable than gold, now they had a cheaper way to refine it uh, because the aluminum oxide is so stable they needed a, a unique way. And there's, no one is really... People have tried to improve on the hall Haro process. They have improved and made it more efficient, but it's still basically the same electrolysis process, process in a molten fluoride. The molten, molten fluorides, some serious environmental problems. And so more and more of the aluminum industry is going offshore. Ship, that, ship those environmental pro pro problems to the third world countries where the environmentalists don't care, right? Um, but uh, aluminum still costs five to six times as much because the energy costs is six times as much. And you're going to have a hard time because that aluminum oxygen bond is pretty fundamental. It's always going to take a certain amount of energy. The whole whole process is probably five times more efficient today as it was in Charles Martin Hall's day. But it's still, there's only so much you can go as you start heading towards uh, um, your thermodynamic uh, efficiency. You can't go beyond that. Uh, it's lighter. It's only 40% of the weight. We know that. And therefore, it's useful whenever something moves, it's good to have a lightweight structural material. And the faster it moves, the more important lightweight is. Remember that principle. So we talked about sprung weight on cars, not for aluminum, but we talked about turbine disks uh, and aircraft. Um, they, find, they claim, the Air Force claims that if they take 20 pounds off a turbine disk in an engine, they can reduce the... Uh, 
what is it? Yes, 20 pounds, 20 pounds off a disc equals 200 pounds in the engine, which equals 2,000 pounds on the airframe, because you don't have to have wings that are quite as strong to hold the engine out there, uh, or wings or whatever, but weight savings on other parts of the structure. You, so taking 20 pounds out of a turbine disc actually ends up being 2,000 2, pounds off the aircraft, and for the military that means greater payload uh, or further range, which is important for them. And given the fact that for them, the value of a pound saved is $1,000 a pound, 2,000 pound savings on a military aircraft is $2 million, right, per aircraft. Now, they may cost $40 million nowadays, or what, the, the uh, Joint Strike Fighter or the X-22 or whatever it is going gonna, is gonna to be $100 million a copy or something like that. It's, it's incredible what fighter aircraft are getting to be, but anyway. Um, one of the one of the aluminum's proper properties is it is uh, lower melting. It melts at 660 centigrade as opposed to steel and nickel alloys around 1500 centigrade. Um, and as a result, you can't use it in very high temperature applications. The typical service temperature for aluminum alloys is less than 200 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, for example, you can't do it anymore because I think the last flight was just last week or something. But if you ever fly the Concorde, if you ever flown the Concorde, I flew it once just to try it. Um, um, it actually did not fly limited on speed; it flew limited on skin temperature because it has heat-treated aluminum alloys, and if it got above 200 degrees Fahrenheit or whatever the magic number was, uh, then the alloy would become overaged and lose its strength, and the thing wouldn't have the properties it was supposed to have. So they actually, on colder days, you could fly faster in the Concorde. And that's why they could come across the ocean at different, different speeds, just happened to do with the uh, surface temperature. They had to measure the surface temperature. Things like the SR-71 Blackbird, the, the spy, uh, spy plane that goes at 100,000 feet. Um, there's so much heat built up there that the skin is all titanium, because you can't make it out of aluminum. Aluminum just can't take those types of, temp types of temperatures that you get on that skin. The aluminum we saw from the ratio analysis diagram is lower toughness than steel. It means that you have some problems. Now, um, because of the lower toughness, and you have to design more carefully because, um, and have to inspect more rigorously for, for flaws. Um, another problem that aluminum has is, well, one advantage is it doesn't rust. That's nice. It's better than stainless steel. Um, However, it is very reactive, um, and in fact, um, it wants to go back to its oxide state. In fact, a lot of the fireworks you see on the 4th of July is aluminum powder burning up. Some of it's magnesium powder, but some of it's aluminum. Um, but since it wants to go back to its native state, it has lots more corrosion mo modes than even steel. Um, and this is an example of a washer on the tail rotor uh, this is painted gray, so it came from a, uh, um, a Seahawk helicopter. This is the steel nut that holds this washer on um, uh, to hold the tail rotor on a Blackhawk. It's a screen. It's a Blackhawk helicopter. Um, Sikorsky builds these helicopters, and it turns out that they also build the Presidential Fleet helicopter. So there is a, they don't call it a Seahawk or a Night Nighthawk or something that they, it's, it's a presidential helicopter. But what happened was this picker alloy is 7075 T6, high strength alloy. Um, and T6, it's heat treated to the optimum uh, strength, because everybody thought strength was important back in the 1950s when this alloy was developed. So they heat treat it and precipitation harden it to the optimum strength. The problem is it has lousy stress corrosion cracking resistance. And what happened is uh, Sikorsky, actually the Navy was the first one, lead users in a chloride environment, found some of these were cracked. And so they told Sikorsky, and Sikorsky looks and they say, oh, we had the same problem with this alloy on another helicopter design we had, and we changed it out, except they keep everything as a separate little organization. And so they hadn't changed it out to a better, actually the same alloy, but a different uh, concentration. Um, our different heat treatment is 7075 T6 is maximum strength. And then there's a 7075, and the T number is 
means annealing or heat treatment, basically. T73 is what's called overaged, and the strength goes from like 73 KSI to 63 KSI. You overage, you don't get as much strength, but your fracture toughness and your corrosion resistance goes way up when you overage. This has lousy corrosion resistance, called stress corrosion cracking. Well, they put, the, they put this one out. They made the, the washers out of this. They put this one out in the fleet. And the Navy's first one sees stress corrosion cracking cracks. And if you lose this washer, you lose the ability to control the pitch of your tail rotor, which means you crash. Not good. Um, so they said, oh, we, we changed it on the other helicopters to T-73. Uh, we ought to change it on the presidential fleet and the others, too. Uh, so they went out and had a thousand or fifteen hundred of these on order. This little puppy costs three hundred dollars. Okay, it's actually quite machined quite precisely and uh, anodized aluminum and everything else. It's I wouldn't want to sell one for three hundred dollars. Of course, I would probably only sell one for three hundred dollars. Um, but uh, actually, I wouldn't because the FAA wouldn't allow me. But um, but even if I was making a thousand, well, maybe if you make a thousand, you probably can make some money off it. But there's a lot of work that goes into this thing. In any case, um, it turns out while there, it took them a, a year, or actually about a year and a half lead time to get these. In the meantime, a helicopter, an army helicopter in Arkansas, crashes and six uh, six people are dead and one's in a coma. And um, it turns out. They start looking a little closer, and they actually find some of these cracked on the shelf, sitting on the shelf, never been used. And the reason is the 70, the T6 heat treatment actually has only, even though it's got 73 KSI tensile strength, the stress corrosion cracking strength is only 8 KSI. And it turns out when you heat treat this thing, you get some residual stresses, and we actually slit this one. Maybe I'll pass around next time. Uh, we slid it and measured the residual st stresses because the thing will expand or contract. And you can actually cut it very, very precisely, very slowly, and actually put strain gauges on it and measure how much it's opening and closing. And you can calculate the residual stresses. It turns out it has about 11 KSI residual stress. That's why it will crack on the shelf with not even in service. Okay. However, if you go to the T73, this, the, uh, and you do the heat treatments properly, they also screwed up on the heat treatment. Um, uh, but uh, they were supposed to get rid of the residual stresses, and they kind of forgot to do that. But anyway, um, uh, the other one will not crack and is safe, and they replace it, and so the, the president can fly in his helicopter again. Don't tell him that he was flying in a uh, playing Russian roulette for a while while he's while he's flying. So, any questions on aluminum? Now, having done a second metal. Let's take another metal, magnesium, in the next couple of minutes. Magnesium, even lighter weight, 1.6 times lighter than aluminum. Um, if you ever, anybody ever felt a piece of magnesium? It's really, I mean, it's amazing how light it is. I don't actually have one. Because they don't make a lot of parts out of magnesium. It costs twice as much as aluminum. Why does it cost twice as much as aluminum? Because basically there's a cartel, an illegal cartel. After World War II, Alcoa and Dow Corning got together, not Dow Corning, Dow Chemical, got together and said, Alcoa says, we'll stay out of the magnesium business if you'll stay out of the aluminum business. And so they did. And so magnesium, Dow owns the magnesium business, and they, they, if you track things over time, you'll find that the magnesium price is twice the aluminum price over time just because that's the way they basically sort of illegally conspired to do this. And people try to prove it a number of times, but... Um, the, the, the data is there, but it turns out the government doesn't really care. Um, and it, there's a good reason why they shouldn't really care, because magnesium is not used for much of anything. The biggest use of mag one of the biggest uses is for corrosion anodes. In every, your hot water tank at home has got a magnesium anode in it to keep the steel from corroding in the water. Um, so the magnesium corrodes as a sacrificial anode. Uh, big business uh, to make those things. Magnesium is a very reactive. Most of what you see in Fourth of July fireworks is magnesium powder burning up. Uh, it's very susceptible to stress corrosion cracking, same type of thing as those uh, those washers. The um, it's so susceptible that if you look at it cross-eyed, 
it'll, it'll stress corrosion crack in humid air if it has very much residual stress. As a result, it really can't be welded. Okay, you can't fusion weld magnesium alloys. Therefore, you can't make them in any kind of complex shape. You can't. You have problems, and they do make. They used to make a lot more magnesium wheels for cars, but they'd have to paint them, and they still do make magnesium wheels. But if you look at them after two or three years, they're starting to corrode. Um, and so now magnesium is used in automobiles, but only in applications like underneath the, the dashboard where everything's protected. It'll never see any road, road salt or anything else. There are a few components inside the engine uh, where things stay hot, and if any water gets on it, it'll evaporate off and things. But magnesium um, is mostly just castings. People have tried to use it for years, and they find that the poor corrosion resistance and the susceptibility to cracking and the problem with residual stresses is huge and they've never really solved the problem. So magnesium, you'll, someone will always ask you to try to invest in magnesium, but the uh, business just doesn't grow. Dow Chemical, or, yeah, Dow Chemical made the wrong choice uh, when, they, when they picked. See, I like the old story, why did, why did New Jersey, why does why is New Jersey um, have so many toxic waste dumps and California has so many attorneys? Anybody know that joke? New Jersey got first choice. Um, so alcohol, I guess, got first choice. So we've now done these three metals. Um, on Monday, we'll finish up the rest of the periodic table. Okay? <laughs>